I'm Gary Garls, curator of Oranges and Sardines, Conversations on Abstract Painting. Over the course of the past year, I did multiple interviews with six contemporary artists, Mark Grotjohn, Wade Guyton, Mary Heilman, Amy Silman, Charlene Von Heil, and Christopher Wool. And these conversations have been central to the creation of this exhibition. For the show, each of these six artists has selected one or two of their own paintings, as well as works by other artists who have been significant in their thinking about their own work. What follows are outtakes from those interviews. And I have had people say, like, how come you show the brush strokes? And I was like, have you ever looked at a Mondrian? Oh, yeah. Just total, total brush strokes. Beautiful, little, beautiful. tiny, wonderful brush strokes. And the way that it leaves the canvas, it kind mm -hmm. of, or it, the way yep. it, the brush leaves the canvas, yep. whether it even goes around the, uh, the side a little bit, mm -hmm. it's like the most gorgeous moments. Makes you happy to be alive. And that's another thing, like, when I started putting the name in, I never thought of, uh, of, uh, of, um, Robert Ryman. I thought I thought of Mondrian. Mondrian because he always has the thing, right. and it never got in the way of the work. But I, you know, I didn't realize this. The carved initials are you know they're cut into the. These uh, these aren't carved. No, no, they're not. Uh, I guess they're just painted, right? Yeah, they're just painted, painted on top. Yeah, right. But but the thing is, right. is like you know when people first start seeing mine, they're like, you're not going to really leave that and stuff, and it's mm -hmm. just like. Uh, again, on a Mondrian, they totally disappear. They're there for you, right. but they also disappear. And I remember going and I gave a lecture at Cal Arts, and this one guy afterwards um, took me and showed me a book of all the different ways that he signed his name. I like all of his work. In some way, that, um, and I think when I started becoming interested in art, his work was some of the first I had seen, mm -hmm. and I didn't study art in college. I can totally see, like, how, you know, it's this illustration of standing in a bar, being in trance with a dancer, and then also, but at the same time, looking at your situation as, like, a viewer in a bar, and then your relationship to the architecture and the stupid box that the dancer is standing on, and then making that leap to this other world that you live in, you know, which is art, or whatever, this other field of language, right. and other set of structures, mm -hmm. and in a way it's my own, like, personal, like, you know, fantasy of that piece as well, and... Uh, and there's something, you know, funny about it, there's something obnoxious about it, there's something super sexy about it, there's something really dumb about, you know, it's really probably just a plywood box that isn't so, I mean, I think it can be so remade, re remade yeah, so no, there's they, nothing they, really yeah, it's, no, fancy it's, about it. Right. So you weren't painting then, though, were you in 67, or you just starting? You were still I was sculpting. A sculptor. Yeah. And we were dedicatedly sculptors, and we had no use for that silly practice, mm -hmm. which we didn't say then. But we had no use for painting. We thought they were dopes. Right. Squares. So why? You, but you had to take a class in painting. No, um, David was famous and fabulous, and so we were all in a room. And I remember the chairman of the department came in, I guess all the graduate students were in a room for some reason, and he said, only the painters can be in David Hockney's class. How many of you, the, all the painters raise your hand, and we all said, <laughs> 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 we raised our hands. And now I realize, looking back, that he was a, was a postmodernist way back then, because he did the uh, pieces that had the shimmer on the surface from the glass that's in front of right. the painting. And he talked about that. A pic that's a picture of a picture. Mm -hmm. And he embraced the Los Angeles uh, gardens slash backyards of the, of the people that commissioned him. Mm -hmm. He loved that. So did you see Hockney paintings in Berkeley? Did he actually have paintings there? Yes, because he, he was working. He had a studio at the okay. school. And oh. so he was painting one. Right. He had a little thing, the way you used to, the old-fashioned way of putting fixative was that you somehow would blow it out of a little thing. 
and he was making the splash water by blowing the paint out of this thing onto the canvas, and I was very impressed with that. Mm -hmm. Again, because it broke the rules. What's fighting? Not, not just I like it, but what's fighting a fight that is interesting? Mm -hmm. You know, and I felt like, you know, that when, you know, when I seized on the South American people, these Argentinian painters, I was right. like, okay, these guys are fighting a fight. They are. A fight that I'm interested in mm -hmm. that I didn't respond to in my work, really. And yet, as soon as I found out about them, like, I was like, the umbrella's open. You know, yes, you know. Yeah, but so when you like, start talking about the Latin American abstraction, that's part of what's going on in that work. And I don't know if that's something that then was playing a role in kind of where you were pushing the work, you know, in the last couple of years. Yeah, I mean, I think that it was, I mean, that's why I was thinking about sculpture and trying to put some sculptures into the room, because I think it was, um, I think that definitely the, um, the, the way it went in a simple way was the work, um, the work that I was doing early, early on was trying to um, kind of fight with the con with certain conventions. Originally, it was probably like the convention that you can't be personal and you can't be diaristic and you can't be sweet and you can't be intimate. I, I mean, I think I was, I, you know, I mean, I remember as a kid, like as a, a student and stuff, like actively thinking, you know, why can't stuff be sort of um, su sort of sweet or mm -hmm. pretty or mm -hmm. tender or intimate or why can't stuff be personal? Um, and and kind of um, humble and not important, mm -hmm. you know. So it was kind of like fighting with the idea of importance. And then I think like I worked my way through that to the point where it was like um, I started to become more interested in uh, why can't something be kind of aggressive and tough. And then um, once it got tougher on the surface. Mm -hmm. Then it sort of seemed like, well, where can you go with this? And then I was friends with a lot of sculptors, and I mm -hmm. think I thought, well, where, where you could go is you could start to make a tough space as well as a tough surface. This Poltec painting, uh, which is just acrylic on a cardboard sort of background, and which is so light and mm -hmm. um, the touch of it is so um, almost like nothing, but then it, it actually has everything also beside everything else about like Cezanne or, you know, mm -hmm. the, the atmosphere becomes the mm -hmm. painting, becomes the, mm -hmm. the frame in the painting, the uh, content in the painting, the, uh, what happens if you're in front of it very close, what happens when you're far away. It actually says everything about painting as much as anything else. But what I loved about it was the fact that it actually says those two words, God is. Mm -hmm. um, uh, it was a strange revelation because I had, so far until then, always um, been very surprised about myself reading all those mystical texts, mm -hmm. Jakob Böhme or Teresa of Avila or Julian of Norwich. Or, mm -hmm. um, I actually have done it my whole life. I really, it's, mm -hmm. it's really true. I've always, and not like tons of it, but always, right. um, or Krishnamurti or whatever, it doesn't right. really uh, matter. And uh, not being religious at all, I've always been slightly embarrassed by it, or, <laughs> I, or I couldn't quite understand the connection. Yep. But, uh, and that painting actually was a revelation because it made me realize that what mystical texts do to me is uh, they create that abstract space of silence in the mind that I want uh, abstraction to do. And um, so the revelation was that it is not that abstract painting is spiritual, the uh, difference is that um, the spiritual is abstract. It mm -hmm. does the same thing. It, yeah. it opens up something <coughs> mm -hmm. that is without words. The, the, and I think this is a perfect the Poltec sentence, God is. I mean, that just fumps the mind, you know, yeah. there's, there's no comment, there's nothing that you, it, it, it is everything and it's nothing. <laughs> mm -hmm. It is really something that fills out the mind without that it um, evokes further language. Yeah. And that is something that I find 
um, really fascinating. That was really important for me. I'm a little reluctant to include him in this whole group because he sort of doesn't fit with the others. But Gustin was always so important to, to me. I mean, everyone sort of knows Gustin now, but, um, well, you know, I saw not the 60s work, but I saw the 70s work right from the beginning. I saw the, um, he, I went to the studio school, right. and he was supposed to be teaching there. He came one day the whole hmm. year I was there, but he was, um, he was listed as a faculty. faculty and, hmm. um, he had a studio in the building, even, just hmm. like the studio school. He was this one artist bridging the gap between abstraction and figuration in this real, um, with this real attractive way of working to to a, to a painting student. For a uh, teenager in art school for the first time, it felt really exciting. Gustin, Martin, it was really only a few moments like that for me. Mm -hmm. But in the end, what I'm doing now with my work is just mainline studio school. It's kind of ironic because it's really about drawing. And I always saw these gray paintings in particular. Where I think you know. I think he was drawing in black, mm -hmm. and the the gray is using white to erase what he had drawn previously. Mm -hmm. To you know, mm -hmm. and, and right. the drawing tends to be more shape than. Um, than other kinds of space, but I, I think that's, you know, that's what it, that's how I always saw it, and that's not so different from what I'm doing now. Mm -hmm.